Cool. Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Blockchain Socialist Podcast again, I'm sure. Today's guest is Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan. She is assistant curator at the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo, New York, an art historian, critic, and educator. So, hi, Dr. Ryan. How are you? Hi. Um, I'm hanging in there, and thank you so much for inviting me to be on this podcast. Yeah, of course. I really wanted you on because I see that you have a lot of experience in the art world well before NFTs were ever a thing, but have seemed to be um, caught up in the uh, NFT world quite a bit. But maybe before we get into all of that, it would be great if you could give just an introduction to yourself, like how, um, like where your experience in art sort of comes from and how you've ended up in this strange place of, of NFTs. Yeah, sure. Um, so I uh, studied art history. Uh, I have a PhD in art history, and I would have taught classes, uh, like undergraduate, graduate level classes on um, the history of modern and contemporary art. But my particular area of interest is art and technology, uh, especially since the 1960s. So kinetic sculpture, video art, computer art, net art. And I uh, basically first started thinking about blockchain around 2016. Um, which is when I reviewed an exhibition that Simon Denny had at Petzl Gallery in New York City. So at the time, I was just starting out my curatorial career. Um, I was uh, working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the Modern and Contemporary Department. Now I'm um, up here in Buffalo at the Albright Knox. Um, and uh, as I was starting out my curatorial career, I was also uh, working as an art critic, and I still sort of actively write for art magazines. So some of your listeners might have read a piece I wrote for Art Forum. Uh, about NFTs last spring called Token Gesture. I also wrote a piece for Art Review at the end of last year um, uh, uh, that, you know, was sort of an attempt to summarize what had happened um, in the intervening months. Um, but yeah, so I was working as an art critic and I, I um, saw this show that Simon Denny did at Petzl Gallery uh, called Blockchain Future States. And it's really about the the sort of subcultures of blockchain and the different uh, political and economic ideologies that are uh, that were shaping blockchain um, as it emerged. And so, and also about the sort of founda foundational myths around blockchain. So looking at blockchain, not just as a technology, but basically as a culture. And I reviewed that show for Art Forum magazine and, um, you know, didn't think too much more about blockchain after that. I had, you know, some people I knew who were in the space um, and had some conversations with them. But obviously uh, with the activity at the beginning of 2021, uh, I just knew that everything was about to change very, very profoundly. It was actually not with the Beeple auction, but with the auction of Nyan Cat. Like once I saw a GIF go for, you know, 600,000 plus, I just knew that something, that there was like major money in this space and that the art world was going to, um, was about to be talking about NFTs. Um, was that before I, or after the Beeple sale? No, that was before. So the Beeple okay. sale had been yeah. announced, but it hadn't been um, achieved yet. So, yeah. so yeah. So I just, you know, I like texted my all my coworkers, and I was like, "You guys get ready to hear about these things called NFTs for you know <laughs> the next few days slash weeks slash months slash years." And you know, over the past year, a lot of people have said like, "When is this going to be over?" And you know, I I honestly just don't know anymore. <laughs> Um, I'm surprised it lasted this long. Like even when I wrote the piece for Art Forum, like I pitched it in February or March, but by the time it came out, it was in the May issue. And uh, I think we were all a little bit concerned that like maybe by the time this actually comes out in print, NFTs will be over and it'll be this like fad and nobody will want to read about them anymore. And yet here we are more than a year later. And, um, you know, there were NFTs. I was just in Los Angeles for the art fairs and, you know, there were NFTs on sale at every art fair I went to. So it's it's clearly not not over yet. Um, and obviously I've, you know, come out, um, with, uh, a lot of critiques of NFTs and of cryptocurrencies and of blockchain and <laughs> have my thoughts about it, but I also want to continue to be part of this discussion because I, I do believe that there is no future for digital art that does not also include NFTs as part of that conversation. And as somebody who is, been thinking about and writing about artists using technology and specifically computers and network technologies for you know a long time now. Um, I just I think it's really important that you know we all stay talking to each other. I guess if we if we like take a step back, 
could you explain a bit what exactly I guess the the digital art world since that's that was your your specialty what that was like before NFTs because I think sometimes I don't know some, sometimes people think like digital art became a thing when NFTs came about but it has like a sort of longer history and trajectory I guess yeah I mean thank you for pointing that out it's something that those of us who were interested in digital art before NFTs were immediately throwing up our hands over is that, you know, everyone's acting like digital art was just invented, um, you know, basically in 2021. But in fact, artists have been working with digital technologies since the 1960s. Like the first computer generated works of art date from 1965-ish. I mean, you could even say 62. Um, so it's been half a century now of artists working with digital technologies and and thinking a lot about the unique affordances of digital tools, like what it allows artists to do that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And so um, I think those of us who have been in this space or who are historians of this space also were a little skeptical at first because we've seen so many fads come and go. Like this is not the first time that the contemporary fine art world has gotten excited about digital stuff right can so, you name any other any of the like previous fads yeah sure so like in the 1960s when it first emerged you had articles in like uh the new york times and in playboy and in all of these major publications talking about this idea that the artist you know was going to be sort of replaced by the computer that the computer itself could now be creative and they were talking about artificial intelligence and um, like all of this, you know, was back in 65. So that that conversation was happening. And then um, it sort of cooled off. And then in the 80s, you have the rise of people using bulletin board systems and um, these networks that are precursors to the World Wide Web. So this is before the World Wide Web when you had um, other kinds of networks where artists were um, finding each other and making work collaboratively through the internet. Um, so artists like Douglas Davis, for example, um, uh, you know, artists like Robert Adrian X, um, who are using these these sort of like specialized systems, like one of them called Artex, that uh, allowed artists to work in this networked way. Um, and then, of course, in the 90s, um, you had this explosion of net art, which um, very quickly was... Uh, I don't want to say fully institutionalized, but it certainly caught the attention of mainstream arts organizations, institutions, curators. So you had um, things like the uh, the zero one zero one zero one show at SF MoMA in two thousand and one, which is sort of a survey of artists working with internet technologies. You had um, the Whitney Museum of American Art launch Artport, which was a special website, special part of its website for. Um, commissioning and presenting like born digital, like web native works of art. You had the Walker Art Center's Gallery 9, which also was a sort of platform, an online platform for net-based artworks. So you you had all this sort of excitement, um, even in like the most prestigious uh, museums um, for artists working with net technologies. And, you know, in the past, you know, 20 years, um, these cycles have sort of continued. So like after the dot-com bubble burst, a lot of that excitement went away <laughs> and there was a new skepticism about net art and it just was sort of, you know, a fad. We also have to understand like all all art movements in the art world, right, are they're sort of cyclical or they're fads. Like it's not unique that like people stop being interested in in digital technology, like people stop being interested in figurative painting or they stop being interested in craft. Like these things sort of always, um, you know, go through boom and bust cycles. But anyway, um, more recently, you could point to something like VR. Like I love um, pointing out to people that in 2016, the website Artsy had uh, an editorial article that was like, VR is the greatest medium of our time. Um, and it's like everybody wanted to do VR. And then like the Freeze Art Fair in New York had like a whole a special exhibition within the art fair of VR. And um, then in 2017, Artsy published another article that was like, move over VR, there's a new medium in town. And that was all about <laughs> augmented reality and how <laughs> augmented reality was going to be like the new hot thing. So like, for those of us who have been around for a minute, it's kind of like, okay, you know, <laughs> it's like, right. we we have seen, you know, people get excited, we have seen people then get sort of exhausted. Um, we have seen the market learn to try to incorporate these new strategies um, of of making and distributing art, 
Um, I mean, there's galleries like, you know, Bitforms Gallery, which is a gallery for digital art, was founded in 2001. Or you could look at, um, you know, the artists like Ole Ole Alina, who back in the 90s were sort of thinking about selling websites and trying to pioneer that, or Raphael Rosendahl, or, you know, so it's like the, the even the idea that digital art market is new is actually um, not true, right? That they're, they're always have been people who have been trying to figure out how to um, create a market around this stuff. But it's basically been the case that for a long time, artists working with with experimental technologies have had their own art world that's actually distinct from the contemporary fine art world. And so I think one really important thing to understand is that there's multiple art worlds, right? So there's like, you know, MoMA and the Whitney and auction houses like Christie's and Sotheby's, but then digital artists have been able to operate within this circuit that's like, the Ars Electronica Museum in Linz or like the ICEA Festival or SIGGRAPH, which is a computer graphics, basically like industry trade show. And and then there's like, you know, just lots of like festivals and like public art commissions. And there's just been a totally different network for um, producing and exhibiting and supporting digital art that had nothing to do necessarily with the traditional fine art market. And then after the rise of post-internet art, about, you know, a decade ago, we saw um, more of those artists sort of crossing over, like artists who were involved in um, like surf clubs and Web 2.0 started getting more gallery representation. Like Corey Archangel, for example, was the youngest artist to have a solo show at the Whitney um, in decades when he had his show um, there in like 2012, I think it was. So um, so it, it's it's complicated, right? Is that there was, there's sort of like these multiple art worlds and there are these moments of convergence and excitement and then a sort of retrenchment. And so I think a long story short, you know, we're all a little like, what's going on with this NFT thing? Is this going to be another example of, um, of excitement and communication and crossing over? And then things will sort of settle back into distinct art worlds. And I think that a lot of us now sort of think that that might be what's happening is that the NFT art world will just develop its own ecosystem. It will have its own artists, its own canon, its own market, its own collectors, its own galleries, its own exhibition spaces. Um, and for me personally, I think that's a bit silly because to me, most tokenized art is just digital art. Like I don't even call it NFT art. I don't use that term because you're basically talking about art that happens like born native digital art that happens to have been tokenized. Um, and so to me, it's like that art is completely worthy of being shown and considered in traditional fine art contexts to the same extent that digital art is, um, which is something that I've you know devoted my career to. Right. So then, like, is um, because there is this um sort of like thread that I see or like narrative that I see uh, a bit, and I'm wondering how you see it. That uh, I, like especially before NFTs, making digital art was like a, a a quite difficult career choice, I guess, or like as an artist to to do like purely digital art. Um, I imagine part part of the reason maybe is that there was not as much of a market for it, or maybe the market was people who like maybe like commissioned their, I don't know, World of Warcraft uh, team that they would like to have a picture of as like these type of commissions, which I imagine you can only get so much out of. And as well, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you can always just like copy and paste like a digital, you know, like a, a JPEG or a PNG or whatever, you know, however you want to say it. And so that that sort of like, in a way, takes took away from these artists from being able to, um, to make money from their work. How 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 do you see that uh, yeah. story? I mean, it's a difficult it's a difficult conversation, right? And like, I want to hold some nuance in this because, on the one hand, it is absolutely true that there are artists who feel like they haven't been supported by the traditional fine art world or the traditional fine art market. Um, and I agree, like it's never been, you know, dominant, let's say, in the way that like painting has or, you know, conceptual art or whatever. Um, that said, it's also not true that they've been totally ignored, right? Like you have had major exhibitions, especially in the past five years. Like if you look at I Was Raised on the Internet at the MCA Chicago or Electronic Superhighway at um, – uh, Whitechapel in London, or if you look at the ICA Boston show, um, Art in the Age of the Internet, like there have been a number of these big surveys. Um, I mean, the DeYoung Museum in San Francisco just did their show on um, 
uh, Beyond the Uncanny Valley, which was about AI and art. So it's like there's been um, exhibitions, there's been support, there's been gallery representation. Um, you know, for the past five years, I would say most major galleries need at least one digital artist in their roster. And I know that that can feel like tokenization, but that's sort of how they work. Like they have one landscape painter, one abstract, you know, person, like one figurative, you know, like that's just that, you know, and so, and it's been clear for a while that, that, you know, you sort of need somebody working with digital stuff in your roster. So um, it's not that there hasn't been any support, but anyway, but I, I, there's there's two important ideas that I was thinking about when you were talking that I just want to call out. One is that, um, you know, it hasn't always been so impossible to imagine selling this stuff, in part because the fine art market for decades now has been able to support conceptual art. Uh, which is frankly even easier to copy than a JPEG file because it's literally just an idea or a series of instructions, um, and um, and and practices like photography, for example, where you know you have a potentially limitless number of editions, but you artificially limit the you create artificial scarcity through the through the contract. So we have had mechanisms for creating artificial scarcity to support a market value, um, you know, for decades now. So I don't think that that was the only barrier. I don't think that it's like, oh, NFTs solved a problem. I think the problem wasn't just a technical one. It was a cultural one. It was that this kind of art that's being made didn't necessarily speak to the conversations that we're having in the contemporary art world. I think that was a sort of bigger part of it. Um, another thing I want to point out is just I think it's really important to remember that it's not just that digital artists have been sort of ignored. A lot of them wanted nothing to do with the traditional art world and the traditional art market. There was an active rejection. Like a lot of artists got into making net art precisely because they wanted to make something that wasn't so easily commodified as a as an object that was like a bourgeois luxury product. You know, like they're very much in line with this sort of avant-garde legacy of artists throughout the 20th century who are trying to make things that really exist in the world that like overcome that boundary between art and life where art is like this luxury good that sits on a pedestal but life is like where you know you have social relations and politics and history and like things actually happen and how do we intervene in that like if you look back at like um you know the constructivists right and and and, and sort of onwards like I sort of see a lot of, let's say, like net art in the 90s as being part of that tradition. Like one of my favorite examples of this very um, like uh, uh, oppositional relationship is Ava and Franco Matas when they showed their work Biennale.py, which was a virus that they co-authored that's in Python. Um, they showed that as part of the Venice Biennale, as part of the Slovenian pavilion. And um, it was something that they showed on like in the space of the Venice Biennale, which is like, you know, the world's biggest, most important contemporary art sort of survey um, on two computers that continually infected and disinfected each other. But at the same, uh, uh, like the opening of the pavilion, like that night, they also unleashed the virus on the world and it actually propagated globally as a virus. And so for me, this is a perfect example of how net art, like, in some sense, doesn't want to be contained by the white walled space, by the by the gallery, by the institution, by art history. Like it kind of wants to escape and run wild and like wreak havoc and do damage out there in the world, thinking of the internet as the public space of exhibition. So um, yeah, this idea that like, oh, you know, it was you, traditional art world always ignored us. It's like, well, first of all, you know, you have like net art being shown at the Venice Biennale. Se I mean, and there's a lot of problems with that history, but anyway, I won't get into it. But second of all, it's like, it, it kind of was a critique of that whole world. Like not all of it, but like a lot of it was actually critiquing the market and critiquing gatekeeping and critiquing all of these things. So I just think the, the story is a little bit more complicated than like, um, you know, this like the way it's sort of being told now, I think, which is just like one of like, oh, rejection, rejection, rejection. And now we're finally getting, you know, right. our due. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. OK. And I guess when it comes to like to me, it seems that there is almost like um, because when I, when I think of art, at least like why how I understand my in my my limited understanding is that uh, what makes art art is kind of like the fact that it is not useful, that it's not like a thing that you use to do something. It's something that you like observe and like learn from it, its observation. Um, 
But then when you <laughs> gave the example of like, will they release a virus into the world? It also seems like uh, like they were trying to, yeah, really push the boundaries on the uselessness of art, I guess. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, no, totally. And um, I think, uh, I mean, what you're talking about is this Kantian idea of, you know, this like purposelessness and, um, you know, thinking of like aesthetic theory. And this is something that a lot of, um, I think, a lot of people sort of intuitively agree with, like, it, it's very helpful also when you're talking about, well, what is the difference between art and design? Or what is the difference between art and architecture or between art and technology? Right? And it's like, oh, well, this thing isn't trying to solve a particular problem. It's not meant to be useful in a particular way. Um, but obviously, these questions then become like really um, thorny, because um, you know, making somebody reflect on something or feel a certain way or, you know, have a space to sort of have a break from like our, you know, contemporary media landscape and and pause and cleanse their palate that there's also a utility for that. So um, I don't even yeah, I mean, these are then these are these are like the foundational questions of all of like 20th century avant garde art, right? It's like, how can something be art and also be useful or try to change things. Um, and so this is very much where my head was at. And maybe it's like when I was a student of modern art. And so maybe that's one reason why I'm really drawn to artists who are working with technologies is because as soon as you're working with technology, as opposed to like oil on canvas, you just because your tools are themselves the same tools that are shaping the world right now, you're already engaging in a very material way with reality in some sense. Um, so not to say that like, you know, um, all net artists are like, uh, literalist or figurative artists or something, but like, you know, you kind of can't help but engage these questions, um, about the social, which, you know, is sort of fascinating again. And that's why also a lot of artists were drawn to working with these technologies is because they were shaping the future. And so I think that for, uh, you know, I hate to speak for like a whole, like, you know, um, group of curators who all have, you know, and art historians and critics and artists who all have very different backgrounds and different investments. But from the many conversations I've had over the past year, I think some of us are sort of frustrated because one of the things that we loved about digital art is the way that it pushed back on its tools, the way that it offered a kind of commentary or critical interrogation or um, perverted technology and, and pushed against the way that you know, websites and databases and algorithms were being adopted and promoted by like multinational corporations and by governments. And so it's a little bit of the question of like, well, what is your relationship here to your tools? Like, what is your relationship to blockchain? What is your relationship to the NFT contract? And there are artists like Rhea Myers or um, like Mitchell Chan, who think very much about the contract and what that means. But I think for a lot of, you know, people who are tokenizing their art, like their JPEGs with NFTs, um, it's kind of incidental, right? Like it, that's not really what the work, it's not really pushing back at these structures of power, right? Which is what technologies ultimately are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I spoke a bit with uh, Rhea Myers in a, in a previous interview as well. But um, so how do you think now we have this uh, better understanding, I think, of history than, than probably most people <laughs> probably who are even involved in NFTs really know, actually. But um, how have NFTs sort of changed this world of, of net art and, and digital art? Or how is it not? Has it has or has just the things have just continued on the same? Yeah, I mean, that's that's like a huge question, right? Like, I wish I knew the answer. I think we're all still sort of trying to see how it's going to play out. I mean, I think that Right now, it feels like the, mm, I want to say like the conversation has begun to shift. Um, I mean, obviously, for the past few months, the debate has been very polarized. And you've seen some traditional artists who were very big in the media art space, digital art space, net art space, who really have come out very strongly against NFTs, um, whether it's for ecological reasons or for political reasons. And then on the other hand, you have the artists who are very much for NFTs, like Rhea Myers. Um, and then in the middle, you have a whole bunch of artists who, you know, I don't know that they're in love with NFTs and they openly say, like, if there was a better alternative, I would happily do that instead. But right now, this is where the money is. And like, I have to pay my rent and like, I'd be a fool not to take advantage of this. Um, 
who are, you know, experimenting with making NFTs. And some of them are like having a really good time and they've become big collectors and they um, have really enjoyed finding community. You know, obviously this is much more, um, I mean, the people I'm talking about are, are, are more likely to be the artists who were on Hick at Nunk and now are on Taya and are working in the Tezos ecosystem and not so much the ETH ecosystem, which I think is a very different sort of group of artists and collector base and is sort of overrun by like 10k pfp projects and that kind of thing um so um you know i judge no artist for making nfts um but it's been very hard to sort of have these critical conversations and not have it just devolve into this you know what i call like an interplanetary war right but i think things are changing um i think you know we are starting to think more long term about building, building structures, building infrastructure that would support these communities and support artists. And, um, you know, obviously it's all dependent upon the cryptocurrency markets, right? It all depends on whether something like the Tezos blockchain can remain a long-term store of financial value. And that sort of remains to be seen. Um, uh, but I, I am excited about, you know, uh, having more opportunities to have conversations around digital art. I'm excited about artists being able to pay their rent. In, in your mind, or like from what you've seen, do you see that? I don't like. Do you have, I guess, experience of artists who were maybe not getting paid before or something like that, and now they're able to get money for their art through NFTs or something like that? Yeah, I mean, we all know super famous examples, you know, of people who have. Um, been able to, and you know, um, buy their first house or like pay off their parents' mortgage, or you know, uh, I can think of half a dozen off the top of my head. But uh, I'm happy for those people. But at the same time, again, like I, I really struggle sometimes in this space because I there's always a but with me, right? Like it's always a but, and um, I also want to hold space to have a nuanced conversation where we can also talk about the fact that most people are not making that kind of life-changing money and to acknowledge that in a certain sense the system needs people to believe that in order to sustain itself right and i don't want to like say pyramid scheme or multi-level marketing because i know that those are really fraught terms and they're definitely insults but like i think it's still objectively the case you know that in order for the system to continue to work, we need more people to be adopting it. And this is why even within the crypto space, people talk all the time about like red pilling people or about onboarding people. There's such a hype to make that happen because if that doesn't happen, then the space is not sustainable, even just on a social level, forget financial. So, um, you know, I like to cite uh, the people who have done the work, right? So Kim Parker, the artist who wrote an article, I think it was back in April, where, um, you know, they did a deep dive on, you know, granted, it was only like one week, right? It was only, and so it's a small sample section. But if you look at the sales, and this is one of the beautiful things about blockchain transactions, right, is that like, they're all public, half of them might be wash trades, and you would never know without doing a lot of forensics, but you know, at least everything there is public. Um, and, and found out that, you know, uh, like a third of artists were selling NFTs for under $100. And that, the average gas fees, basically, and transaction fees were $100.50, which means that for a third of those sales, the artist actually lost money on that transaction. So I just think that we need to look at you know these anecdotal stories. And I certainly know not only really famous you know, NFT people in the space, but personally artists who have been making money, um, and I'm very happy for them. But we also need to think about, you know, who exactly is really profiting. And um, it continues, like all of the market studies continue to report that um, it's actually a very narrow bandwidth of people who are benefiting. So, for example, um, Art Tactic did a report that came out at the end of last year that said that women account for only 16 percent of the NFT art market. And granted, that's more than the like traditional blue chip contemporary fine art market, right? So I don't want to, you know, be in a glass house and throw rocks. But, um, but it's also not like fifty percent, you know. Um, and also, and again, th they were only looking at Nifty Gateway, so this is only like a small subset of the market overall. 
but they also found that 55% of sales um, went to just 5% of the artists, which is only 16 artists. So you have 16 people who are making 55% of the sales. And that overall, the top 25% of the artists accounted for 90% of the sales. And, you know, so you just look at the data and, you know, granted, obviously, you know, one of the advantages also of the you know blockchain space supposedly is anonymity. So I question, like, how do they even figure out the gender breakdown, right, when so many wallets are anonymous? But I guess for the people that can be tracked, right, I think anecdotally, we all know it's true. Like, if you just think about who are like the top 10, right, it's going to be like, a, you know, a Beeple, Rafik Anakdal, you know, like it's, you know, and then you have a few breakthroughs like Paris Hilton and Ferocious or, you know, um, who are like non-binary or trans or women, but like, that's not the, that's not the most of them. Right. And same thing for artists of color. So, um, yeah, it's just, I'm not saying that it's hopeless. Um, I'm not saying that the traditional art market is any better. I'm just saying that, is this the golden like, you know, is this like the, the the silver bullet, right? Is this the thing that's going to fix everything? And my answer always with technology is that, you know, I'm not a techno-utopianist. Uh, I'm, I'm somebody who believes that technologies reflect the cultures that make them. And I really wish I could remember who said it. But on the other day, Twitter was like, culture is like L0, right? <laughs> like even before you have your chain, you have the culture. And, and technologies always will reflect the values and the worldviews of the people who make them, um, whether by design or just by accident. Um, so I'm just not fully convinced that this is, um, you know, it's it's not, it doesn't seem like it's currently the like magic solution, but I also don't want to be the person who's like, well, therefore you like should completely stop trying and just give up. And that's not what I'm trying to say. That's not what I'm trying to advocate. I'm just saying that it means we need to build these systems with a lot of intention, which means we need to build them slowly and carefully with critical dialogues from diverse stakeholders to really think about the intended consequences and also the unintended consequences, especially on communities you know, who historically have not been enfranchised or had a seat at the table. So like, if we want this space to be better, right, like we have to think about how we're building it. And so far, what I've been seeing is that it's not necessarily being built in a way that, for example, insulates people from abuse or that um, really amplifies the voices of marginalized creators, right? Like just creating an anonymous system isn't really the way to equity, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah I, I find that sometimes the the whole, like we, we've solved the, the issues of diversity or racism because everyone's anonymous, kind of ridiculous. It just means that like... <laughs> If, if you say you are like a person of color, then people will be mad at you or something like that. You know, it's not really uh, solve the problem. Well, I, I mean, I literally just curated an entire show with this, along with the artist Paul Venus called Difference Machines, Technology and Identity in Contemporary Art, that was precisely about the intersection of technology, identity and social justice. And, you know, we've been living with this idea since the 90s that, you know, on the Internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Like you can be anybody you want it, online. It's like the, the rebirth of an old idea, really, that, that, that I saw when I, when I when I saw like someone say that I was like, I remember this being said, like over a decade ago. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, no, I mean, like three decades ago at this point, right? Like there's mm. been this idea that, you know, we can escape into the into the metaverse and, um, you know, that you can be anything you want and that it's so liberatory. But, you know, there's a lot of limits to that. Uh, you know, even just thinking like in terms of access uh, before you even get to the metaverse, who who can go there? You know, um, very early on, um, uh, you know, I, I heard someone say that, like, if you think about it, you're building an entire financial system that is based on the idea of having cheap and reliable access to electricity and so you say that this is about empowering like the so-called global south or third world, but like uh, basically this is also a system that privileges early adopters and the richest people will be the ones who get in before everybody else. And so you're actually stacking the deck against people who don't currently have ready access to electricity, for example. Like if you truly think that like blockchain is going to become global currency and will replace other forms of fiat, like... You know, I, so this is what I mean when I say that, like, you know, I'm not really a techno utopianist and that it's it's not impossible, but you have to have these conversations like what are you doing to ensure that you are not disenfranchising um, 
you know, communities that have already been disenfranchised or, you know, creating new new power structures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's um, anyone who says that like NFTs or I don't know, have to, if anyone says like X is, is like the golden bullet that's going to solve anything, like it's like it's always wrong. <laughs> you know, it just like happens over and over again. But um, I feel like the oh, in the sort of like absence of I don't know, good public spending or like some sort of like appropriate social welfare system. It's hard for me to be like, uh, no, you shouldn't do that as as an artist. You shouldn't like uh, make NFTs because that's actually uh, actually it's really bad. And somebody who made blockchain was a was a mean person. Like to me, it it feels like so uh, out of touch and like, I don't know, virtue signaling in like the worst possible way. I couldn't agree more, which is why, I mean, and people can like check their receipts on this, like look on my Twitter account. And ever since this whole thing started, I've continually said, I blame no artists for doing this. Like, I think that the fact I've also said, you know, recently, and I took some heat for it because people really wanted me to come out and really condemn. And I'm like, I am not in the business of telling artists how to pay their rent. Like that is a step too far. Right. Like my job as a critic and a curator and art historian is to talk about the art and to promote and amplify the work of artists who are doing good work. But like how they choose and where they choose to sell their art is really literally none of my business. So um, and I want to be very conscious of the kind of privilege that I have. Like I have a salaried job with health insurance. Like who am I to tell somebody who's in a more precarious state that they have to choose to, you know, make an ethical choice, right? That like only I have the luxury of making, frankly. Like I don't need to make NFTs to pay my mortgage. So I even have a mortgage, which just shows you how privileged I am. So um yeah, so so what I would like to do is to not focus on attacking individual artists or individual operators within this system. I want to focus on the systemic questions and you nailed it, right? Which is like, you started that by saying in the absence of a social safety net or public support for the arts. And so for me, the rise of NFTs has more than anything else been an indictment of business as usual. Like the fact that people are so, the fact that they are so compelled to go to NFTs, the fact that they feel like they have no other options means that you know, the art world was broken. It means that society was broken. And I think that one of the smartest analyses I read actually about this whole NFT thing doesn't even necessarily come from within the art world. Um, I don't know if you caught it, but um, a while ago, I want to say like last last spring, March, March 21, um, this guy Felix Salmon, Salmon um, wrote this article, um, uh, GME Doge Supreme how getting rich went full internet. And um, he he talks about, I mean, he has all these like funny acronyms, um, but uh, YOLO Zerp Swag, which he explains what he means. I mean, we all know what YOLO means and we know what swag means. But anyway, um, he explains basically how, you know, we now have a generation of people who, uh, and I'm sort of at the elder generation of the millennial, so I'm kind of included in this, who like have lived through a series of supposedly once in a lifetime events, right? Like 9-11 was literally my first day of college. And then you know the 2008 financial crisis, which led to, um, for example, um, uh, sort of basically reducing compound interest rates to zero, which meant it was harder and harder to build wealth um, throughout a lifetime. You also have like the transformation of the workforce to the gig economy where there's no benefits, there's no 401ks. Like it does a really smart analysis, I think, of talking about all of the um, like very specific concrete conditions that have made an entire generation, perhaps two generations of people feel like um, they live in this economy where basically the the only hope you have is to sort of gamble on a get rich quick scheme that there's no other like nobody believes in the American dream anymore. Right. Like nobody believes that um, it's possible to just like work hard and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I mean, that was always a myth that capitalists promoted anyway in order to erode, you know, calls for social safety nets. But like we know that's not true anymore. And so um, I think that that like whenever I'm asked to talk about NFTs, I mean, they want me to talk about them in our historical context, but I was like, you have to talk about the crash of 2008. Like you have to talk about the sort of economic conditions, right, that have driven people to this. Um, 
And so what I would like to propose, what I've been proposing is that we try to spend as much energy fighting for NFTs and building NFT communities, um, that as much energy as we're expending on that, we expend on like fighting for UBI and fighting for the public funding of the arts. And, you know, none of these alternatives are without flaws, but I would rather have like a rich menu of options, right? Where we have UBI, public funding of the arts and a private art market and, you know, um, like the festival circuit, like, and, like I just want more options for artists, not less. Hey everyone, if you're enjoying the episode so far, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, share with a friend, and join the crypto leftist communities on Discord or Reddit, which you can find links to in the show notes. If you're enjoying the interview and find the content that I make important, you can pitch into my efforts starting at $3 a month on patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist to help me out and join the newest patrons like Anna Marie, Luke, Christopher, Harvey, Ishan, Al, VX89, Man Abu, Joanna, Claire, Joshua, and Peter. Any amount really helps since making this stuff isn't free in terms of money or time. As a patron, you'll get a shout out on an episode like I just did and access to Patreon exclusive content like Q&A episodes where you can submit and vote on questions you'd like me to answer and I'll give my thoughts in roughly 20 minutes. In the last Q&A episode, I gave my thoughts on the proof of stake versus proof of work debate from a socialist point of view. Of course, I'll still be making free content like this interview to help spread the message that blockchain doesn't need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation if we put our efforts into it. So if that message resonates with you, I hope you'll consider helping out. Also, I've recently started publishing some writing on Mirror, which is a publishing platform with Web3 tools built into it. The last piece was about synthesizing my thoughts on DAOs and anarcho-syndicalism and their relation. So if you want to find that, you can read it at theblockchainsocialist.mirror.xyz. I plan to use Mirror every once in a while to publish articles meant to target people who are heavily involved in Web3, but also still make it approachable enough for people who are not. As well, I might use it to use any of the tools that they have on the platform for fundraising for anything, if that need ever arises. So check that out after you finish this podcast, of course. Right, I feel like if you are very, very anti-NFT for whatever reason, then you should, I think it would, it would probably be slightly better of a thing to do rather than like shaming people who make NFTs is to like fight for like creating the conditions in which you don't, no one has to sell an NFT, then, you know, the, the exactly. make, make it such a great world that nobody needs cryptocurrency anyways. <laughs> Yeah, it, you know, totally. And I, I know, you know, from following your Twitter feed um, and listening a little bit to what you've, you know, done, like, I know that, you know, you're interested in blockchain as being a pathway, like, towards a socialist future. And I'm um, not, I'm a, I'm a little more skeptical on all of that. But that's, um, that's, that, I, that's not how I would characterize it. But okay, how would you characterize I get that. it? I get that a lot. <laughs> oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. I mean, no, um, I mean, I just, to me, I, I mean, to me, the whole project was just like, uh, what's happening in blockchain from like a socialist lens and how can it be utilized for socialist quote unquote things, but not that like um, blockchain creates socialism in, in some kind of way. It was just sort of like, um, uh, to me, it's more about, because at the time, especially at the time, there was like basically, it was very little analysis on it, I thought. And so it was just like, how how do you respond to this thing that is like probably coming? Um, so that's sort of how I, I kind of, how, how do you respond to it and what do you do with it if it's going to be there in the same way that like, I don't know, so, social media was coming, uh, 10 years ago and now it's here and how do we, re how are we responding to it? And largely we're responding to it by like getting mad at each other online all the time. Um, that, that's such a perfect characterization actually of how I feel about this. It's like, well, there's this thing that's coming. And so like, how am I going to deal with it? Right? Like, I'm not going to put my head in the sand, but how are we going to, you know, have a critical conversation about it and create space for that? So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated now to, you know, watch the, the development of DAOs and the way in which people are trying to bring together like art and socialist values, let's say, and like blockchain. collectivist, maybe collectivist values. There you go. Um, and you know, I really respect the work of you know groups like Furtherfield to have these conversations. We've been having these conversations for a long time now. Um, so I'm very curious. I'm sort of sitting from the sidelines, and you know, we'll. I mean, we'll, we'll see. I guess I don't know. I'm also incredibly skeptical. Um, I think you know, there's 
as always, we just need to do a lot of work to define our terms, right? Like what is the difference between socialism, like class solidarity, mutual aid, uh, you know, it's it's like <laughs> What is it exactly that we're fighting for? Even like democracy, and this is something I pointed out in my art review piece um, from the end of last year, is like, what do we mean when we say democracy? Because I think in a lot of DAOs, the idea of democracy is like, well, one person, one vote, and that's and then it's majority rule. But there are reasons why like the founding fathers of America argued for a representative democracy and like part of that has to do with like really terrible things like slavery, but also, you know, part of it has to do with how do you protect a minority from mob rule? And so I'm not saying it's an impossible project, but it's like, how do we, um, how do we, you know, imagine social spaces that, um, that have protections for the most vulnerable and how do we imagine social and financial systems that don't create uh like not just privilege but like generational forms of inherited privilege right like how do we how do we think about these things in a sort of systemic level and um until we are having those conversations and again there's some people that i think are trying to have those conversations but at this point it's like if your idea of democracy is like you know one person one vote or god forbid one token one vote which is like the worst nightmare um, it's really hard to not see these spaces as just being like technologically encoded hypercapitalism. Right. No, yeah, indeed. I mean, I think what is like, what I think seems to be happening to me for the most part, um, besides like a lot of DeFi pro, well, but like a lot of projects like relying on token governance, I think there is like a, the problem is that it's like a niche inside of a niche inside of another niche of like people who are really interested in like alternative types of organization and and governance that I find really really interesting but I also know that like not like it, there's not a lot of people <laughs> in in that space um that I find interesting uh and it's still it's still like pretty nascent and pretty like emergent I think it's just going to have to take some time before it really like proves itself yeah and part of the I think like like the token governance stuff, it just it looks like it looks like already existing capitalism to me. So like it was very easy to implement, not only like technically easy, but also like as a mental model for people under, to understand as like very easy uh, to do. Yeah, totally. Um, and then sorry, I almost like to interject it because I was like you reminded me of something I was going to say earlier, which is that you know another thing I get frustrated by in a sense in the conversations in this space is that. Like the so-called like evil trad art world was actually having these conversations before NFTs came along. And this is something else I said in my art review article. I just gestured towards it. Like, you know, maybe it wasn't moving fast enough. Right. But like there was a real sort of movement building. Like if you look at the work of Caroline Woolard, who's an artist who um, helped start this group um, art co-op, like really thinking about what it would mean to have artist cooperatives and to try to work not just collaboratively, but like collectively, right? And so the contemporary art space was one space in which those kinds of ideas were being tested out. And um, I guess I just get a little frustrated with a lot of the discourse coming out of the crypto space because it's just like we get painted as these like, you know, you never cared about digital art and you know, you never um, like, you know, thought about um, these issues or like you never like you, you weren't working on like uh, collectivism or you weren't working on representation or diversity or anything. It's like, actually, this is what we've been working on for like a decade. Where have you been? Like, these are like the hottest topics, actually, in the field of contemporary art. <laughs> so um, and again, I totally acknowledge it's like not enough, but I just think to throw the baby out with the bathwater and to erase the good work that's been done largely by like queer trans non-binary like artists of color like that's kind of problematic to me um not just artists but curators too like i mean um or even if you think about what's going on right now with disability and contemporary art where there's like a lot of new interest in thinking about that i mean colby chamberlain wrote a major article in an art forum about this and um you know you have now like disabled artists being more represented in like the whitney biennial um, like people like Christine Sun Kim and um, 
you know, it's just like it's it, it, we were having these conversations and it, it seems like it's a shame not to build on them together um, and to just sort of say, well, you know, this space has like nothing to offer me. I have nothing to say to it. So and that goes both ways. You know, that goes both ways. Um, I guess I get the impression maybe as well that NFTs kind of just showed up along with a lot of money and that sort of maybe a bit overshadowed a lot of other conversations that I guess were happening at the same time in in the art world. Well, but it's always been the case, right? That like the yeah. most interesting conversations don't necessarily align with where the money is. And this is another thing that I think those of us in the traditional art will get a little frustrated by is people keep talking about the traditional art market and conflating it with the traditional art world. And I keep trying to explain for those of the people who don't know a lot about the art world and how it works. Well, first of all, there's many art worlds. But second of all, you know, the art market is like one sector, right? The like for-profit commercial side with these, you know, blue chip galleries and these crazy auction results that, you know, everyone loves to make fun of. But uh, there are, you know, arts writers, critics, art historians, artists who work in a different way or outside of that model, um, nonprofit spaces, like artist run spaces, uh, arts workers, like, you know, art handlers and registrars and museum frontline staff and educators. And like, there's just a whole world of people, many worlds of people who, frankly, like, you know, most of us work for like no money. <laughs> um, and, or like, we don't, you know, like, we're not all like super rich or super privileged. And, we um, are having these critical conversations, and at some points it intersects with what the like high end market is doing. But at and and some you know a lot of that work is sustained by the high end market, right? Through the form of like you know board members giving you know financial donations and things like that. But um, it's also kind of independent, and so I think um, you know. But this comes from just people not being familiar, right? Like not knowing where to find those conversations. It's like they know about the sales because that's what gets written about and that what kind of what, what kind of like crosses over into mainstream consciousness um you know thanks to like the lack of art education and also like the firing of most full-time art critics on most major museum newspaper staff so it's like the kinds of conversations that the rest of the art world is having beyond the market there's just not as many outlets and there's not as many advocates, not as many voices to sort of bring that work to the general public. So again, I don't really blame anyone for like not knowing these things, right? It's more of a systemic thing of like the way that like, you know, hedge funds took over newspapers and gutted their staff, like, in, you know, like 20 years ago, like that, like what we're seeing now is we're reaping what we sow. It's like we fucked around and now we're finding out, right? And like, it's all related. And I don't think you can talk about, you know, NFTs without talking about all of this larger context, right? Yeah, for sure. I it's um I I, I feel the frustration uh, that a lot of people have about like I don't know, about a, a lot of this stuff around around um, the speculative aspects and and all these things, but it's also like I think if you understand that it is a systemic issue and like just constantly being angry about I don't know all all of the things that you don't like, whether it's aesthetic or whether you find it's uh, because you know, it doesn't align with your political values, theories, morals, or whatever. Um, like, you, you're just not going to get anywhere being angry all the time about it. And you sort of have to be, I don't know, cognizant of, like, the fact that it is systemic. You can't really respond, I don't know, in the same way as you would, like, maybe other types of issues in your life, personally, I guess. No, that's a, that's a really good point. And it's something I'm trying to be really cognizant of, is that it's... I was actually just having this debate with a friend earlier today. Like, I think it's really important to be critical. It's like really important to say what you are against. That's the function of criticism and critique is that sometimes you can't figure out what you're for until you figure out what you're against, right? Like it's a it's a learning process. It's a pathway. Um, and definitely is like speaking as like a critic and a curator, like I'm not an artist. I'm not the visionary. I'm not the one with the ideas, right? I can sit here and sort of react. And so I can say, well, not this or this isn't good. But it's not my job to say what is good, right, or what it should be because I'm not an artist, right? I'm a critic. Um, and so I can have, like, productive dialogue. But um, I'm not the one with the solutions, right? So I think that that's a really important function, right, is, is for that space of critique. 
On the other hand, I, I've been thinking a lot about the fact that it's also really important to amplify the the work that you do want to see amplified out in there in the world, the whether it's art or whether it's um, you know, political movements or whether it's like certain activists or organizations, like I'm a big believer in amplifying. Like I say that fundamentally my job is basically to amplify, like to platform artists who I think are making good and important work. I, I see myself as a kind of facilitator. Um, so, uh, and interpreter. So, um, I think it's, I think you're right. It's sort of exhausting to constantly be against, against, against. And I try to make sure that, you know, uh, that in between all of my tweets being against something, I am also offering up information about like what I'm for, right? Which is why like yesterday I was like, hey, let's talk about UBI again, <laughs> right? That like um, artist pensions are sort of problematic because they're gate capped and who gets to qualify for them. And the market is obviously problematic because the market will never really support work that is truly experimental or that is against hegemonic values or against capital or against certain kinds of privilege, right? Like, so, you know, so you don't really want the market to be the only thing either. And so that's why I'm saying, okay, well, what about UBI, right? What about something that's like truly universal (laughs) that um, would get around some of these problems that would like materially improve the lives of artists and give them the space that they need to do the work that they want to do? So um, yeah, trying to be, you know, to, to sort of seize upon positive alternatives and to to like draw attention to them is also you know what i think we all need to be doing um yeah and that 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 wasn't me saying that like you know don't critique (laughs) or something like that but um yeah uh there's obviously a need for critique you weren't saying but somebody else i was talking to today was like just focus on the good stuff and i was like no no no. you also have to focus (laughs) on the bad stuff right like you kind of need both to happen yeah, it's a uh, it's always a complicated conversation. <laughs> yeah, because you also don't want to like platform bad ideas, right? I mean, this is why like everyone always says like don't dunk on somebody on Twitter by just like retweeting them, <laughs> right? Like mm. you're just you know amplifying things that don't need to get amplified. So I'm also like cognizant of that dynamic. Right. But based on going a little bit deeper into maybe what uh, the positive things or like the the ways that you would like it to move, like what are some things in the NFT world when it comes to art and um, what types of things would you like to see more of or the space to move towards or um, or should they stop what they're doing completely? <laughs> That's always an option, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I think that ship has sailed. Um, I do think that the market is cooling. I think the crypto whales aren't being as active. I think, you know, you're seeing more like projects that aren't instantly sold out. But then I don't know, Outland had a drop yesterday, their first drop that like sold out in five seconds. So what do I know? You know, it's like you think things are cooling. And, you know, I heard that like a lot of activity on Tezos had really cooled off. And then suddenly it's like, you know. So um, anyway, so I, I think I've talked to a lot of like major collectors who in the NFT space who actually think that like a correction is coming. Right. And I don't know if bubble bursting is the right metaphor, but you know, that things will sort of cool off and then you'll, you know, once the money, the quick money doesn't seem to be there anymore. uh, It'll flush out a lot of the scammers and the grifters and the spammers and we'll be left with, you know, more serious artists and collectors who are really in it for the art. Um, So, uh, you know, and also to make money, nothing wrong with that. Um, so, uh, I hope that happens, um, personally, just because I don't like spam and scamming and grifting to exist in anywhere, um, uh, not just, you know, in the art world. Um, I, what I would like to see then, assuming that that happens, uh, or maybe even if it doesn't, if there's a way that we can carve out a corner of this activity for a kind of conversation around digital art um, that includes exhibitions, like curated exhibitions, um, publications, communities speaking with each other in spaces like Twitter spaces and Discord and Clubhouse, if anyone still uses that, um, that really reflects the kind of values that I hold and that a part of the traditional art world holds as well. And again, people love to dunk on like the high end market. Like, well, it's just about money for you guys too. It's not about the art. It's not about the ideas. And it's like, well, don't conflate like one aspect of it 
you know, where yes, artworks are treated as, you know, appreciating assets and they're just commodities that are stored in free ports. It's like, that's fine. But that's also like a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver at the top of the art world, right? Like there's a much bigger world. And so for many of us, it is about um, these values of, you know, like without sounding totally sappy and romantic and like retrograde, but like, I don't know, like beauty and truth and community and, you know, always understanding, of course, that these terms are not universal and that they're sort of culturally specific and that we need to always question, like, what do we mean when we say beautiful and who are we excluding from that story? Um, but, you know, I I do believe that art is really powerful. I, you know, I art is the most important thing in my life. Art, like, is what I would get out of bed in the morning. Art is, I mean, and, and I, you know, people can define it differently. Like, some people call it poetry. Some people call it presence. But, like, art is how... It, it's what makes life worth living, right? Like it makes me uh, not just exist or like subsist on this planet, right? It makes me glad to be alive and to be here and to feel, you know, like I'm um, making the best use of my time and, you know, like actually experiencing it and not just sort of suffering through it. So, um, okay, so those are my very romantic ideas about art, <laughs> which are like you know, probably highly problematic and I'm going to get canceled. But, um, in ways that I can't even anticipate. But uh, I uh, I really truly believe that digital art is art. And, you know, I have seen digital works of art that have made me cry. I have seen digital works of art that have made me burst out laughing. Um, like the full spectrum of the human experience and the full spectrum of what art can do. And so I would love if you know, there's, there's space for us to like actually appreciate art together, whatever that looks like, even if it's like asynchronous, even if it's virtual. Um, I hope that there is space for us to talk about art, um, to talk about, and not just for the sake of like being fancy and flexing, right. But like to really connect with each other and to connect over these meaningful, profound experiences and to work out together, like how it means and what it means and to share that experience, which is like, as you know, can be as important as the art itself, right. Is like the community that it engenders, um, the conversations that it stimulates, the connections that it helps forge. Um, so I, I, I hope that we see that. And I think that if you look at a publication like Outland, which is also an NFT platform now, um, if you look at, um, you know, some of these new initiatives that are trying to create more space for curation, whatever that might mean. And it means different things to different people. But, um, you know, on a very basic level, it's like I'm a big believer in Marshall McLuhan's like the medium is the message and that, you know, how you code things actually conditions what you're able to say. And so one of my one of the reasons I instantly hated all of these platforms that emerged a year ago or that you know had been emerging since 2018 is that they literally didn't have a text box to be able to say something about the tokenized asset it was literally just like a listing where you have the jpeg file and like hash for the wallet whatever and like you know uh, like linked to ipfs whatever like you had all of the information you would need to understand that thing as an asset as a digital record but you didn't have anything that would help you understand it as a work of art. Mm, like for the artist to say something about their piece of art. Like the artist or, or like a, or a curator or somebody that there's literally not like a text box, you know, or, you know, it doesn't even have to be text based, but like the ability to juxtapose different objects in space together. I mean, this is what curators fundamentally do. We bring artworks together in space. Right. And we we select them and we arrange them so that they are so that we're creating dialogues between them. Right. And these dialogues tell a story even without words. So, um, you know, the fact that there wasn't, you know, immediately any easy way to do that, that basically the only way you could collect your NFTs was by having them exist together in a wallet. But that's not a context. It's not a meaningful context, right? It's just like this randomness of like, they all happen to be in a wallet together. So, um, you know, there literally weren't mechanisms for meaningfully juxtaposing works of art. There weren't mechanisms for 
sharing texts about works of art where an artist could sort of explain their process or why they did what they did, right? It was just like commodities listing. And um, it was built for like the investor. It was like built like in the mind of what would an investor want to see, like in the, I don't know, in the worst sense of an investor almost. Yeah, no, no, totally. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, basically it was just the information you needed in order to indicate its provenance. And, um, and that's it. But like, that is the. Just so you can say it looks rare, dude. <laughs> like it looks rare, dude. Exactly. It's like you're, you're focusing on the scarcity, but it's like well, why is this object even an interesting thing? Or, you know, by object, when I say object in the space of digital art, I just mean like asset or file. Um, but we refer to art objects in the expanded sense. So like you can call a website an object as far as I'm concerned. Um, so like we look at these things, you know, um, it's like, well, wh wh why? Like, why is this something that's interesting to collect? Why is this something that's interesting to have? And like, you know, a lot of the conversations that I would drop into, it's like, well, it's so dank or like, it's so, you know, like, it's, just, it's so cool. I love it. It looks so cool. And I'm like, that's fine. But my job as a critic, a historian and a curator is to actually increase your appreciation of this thing by walking you through it, by working with you. You know, like one of the classic questions when you teach art history is what did you see that made you say that? So I would love to have these conversations where it's like, okay, you think it looks cool, but like, what do you see that makes you say that? Oh, well, you know, I just, I really love like, you know, the colors on it. And I was like, okay, well, what do you see that make you say that? Oh, well, I really love that they're like bright colors. It's like, okay. And so you have these, this is like the conversations I would have with my undergrads. And it actually would make the work more meaningful to them because they would understand why they liked it, you know, like, and that's actually a big part of, of art appreciation and like making it meaningful to people's lives. So, and anybody's able to do that. You just need, you just need the desire to do it and you just need the patience and, you know, you need markets and you need platforms that create the space for that to happen. Right. And one of the frustrations has been that, you know, the space has moved so quickly. It's been really hard to build all of that and to create that time. And I know, you know, one thing everyone keeps saying that somewhat encourages me is that it's still early days. We're talking about something that it's been like less than a year since the Beeple sale, which like blows my mind. It, it feels like a decade. <laughs> one year. I'm, I mean, yeah. Crazy. I mean, between that and COVID, I'm like, I don't know what year it is anymore. I don't know what's going on. I've lived like five years in the past five months, but then also the last three years has only been six months together. So like, I don't understand anything that's happening anymore. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, it is it is it is probably really true that it's still early days. And if the space doesn't completely burn out and just disappear in three months, which, you know, everyone's been thinking is going to happen for the past 15 months, um, then you know, maybe, maybe we'll get to that point. And, you know, maybe it, there's still a lot of maturing that needs to happen. But money just makes everything complicated, you know, like in a good way and in a bad way. And I think that when there's this much money at stake, people, and again, as we talked about, when, when so many people are so precarious, right, then the focus is just on getting that bag as quickly as possible before everything goes away. You know, like nobody's really having these like long term conversations about, well, what does it look like to build an NFT platform that's going to be around in five years? And what kind of value would it have to bring to artists and to collectors beyond just financial value? So, um, yeah, my prediction and my hope is that OpenSea just sort of like <laughs> goes away <laughs> or just like platforms like that um, go away because it, it seems to I mean, you you basically summed it up is that it, it really is created it's like a stock market for art rather than like it like for for the appreciation of art for sure and the other thing you know we didn't talk about is that we talk about nfts as opportunities for artists but there's also a you know there's also damage being inflicted right and i don't want to you know make too much out of it because i know it's like a, a you know there's a lot of debate over this but like the fact that now you can have people so freely plagiarizing other artists' art. And not only is it much easier now to plagiarize a work of art because it's literally right-click save, um, but there's it's also harder for artists who have been plagiarized to fight it because what are the mechanisms in place? Like, okay, you can like try to petition OpenSea to like delist it, but it's still on chain. And 
you know, it's not like you can easily like sue somebody like you can't sue an anonymous wallet um, that easily. I don't know of anybody doing that yet. Um, so how would you even recover the funds that somebody made by like passing off, like selling work as if it was, you know, your work as if it was theirs? Um, you know, it's like, it's just kind of a nightmare for artists in many ways too. And again, this is what happens when you build a system without thinking about unintended consequences. Like you focus so much on like, it's so great because now we don't have gatekeepers. So now every artist, they won't need to fight for years to get gallery representation. They can just go on OpenSea and list it right there themselves. And there's no gatekeeping. It's like, okay, well, that sounds great until you think about, well, what happens when somebody rips off your work? <laughs> And what mechanisms are you going to put in place to address it? It's like, okay, well, now if you're going to start talking about mechanisms to address it, guess what? Now we're no longer having this whole decentralized thing. Now we're back to having gatekeepers. Now we're back to having, you know, middleman who can sort of step in. So it, it's just a mess, right? Like it just needs to, um, and I don't know what the solution is. I truly don't. Like, how do you keep the good part, but get rid of the bad? Yeah. I guess some people would say like, well, you can't it's just sort of like accept it. Um, but then, but I, at least with this digital art, this right click, right click slave uh, type of stuff, at least my, my thinking would be that that would have been a problem already within the, the digital art world before the difference maybe here is that of course you can, is like the tokenization aspect of it and that someone may buy it i would think that if someone does buy it that must mean that they are a poor like art collector like they don't like they, they did not do any sort of like work to like not that i'm making excuses or anything but like they're kind of an idiot for like doing that because it's not like the right it wasn't like the original art but like you wouldn't even know right like say you like, it's one thing to be like, oh, well, you knew this work was by John Smith and you didn't verify that the wallet that it came from, that like John Smith didn't tweet out, like, I attest that this is my Tezos wallet or whatever, right? But what if you don't even know that John Smith made it? Like, what if you're just randomly looking on OpenSea and you find some cool stuff and it's being sold by, you know, Adam Brown and you buy it and you don't know that actually John Smith made it, you know, because there's like no watermarks, there's like no indication. I mean, you could do a reverse Google image search and try to see like, you know, and then maybe you would get to John Smith's website and you would see, but like so much information now, I mean, this is one of the big problems with web too, right? Is like locked behind, you know, uh, is locked behind platforms. And so you may not even be able to find it that easily. And I mean, yes, you could have always in theory, you know, plagiarized somebody's work, but there was never really an incentive to, as you said. Um, and also, you know, something else that's worth considering is that the rise of NFTs has also changed the nature of digital art because what we're seeing now is that um, because of the technical limitations of the platforms, it really incentivizes artists to make or at least to try to sell certain kinds of work, right? Like JPEG files or GIFs or MPEG files. And like uh, the digital artists in the 90s, they were making like websites, like they were making HTML and like you can or they were making software. And in theory, of course, you could tokenize software. You could tokenize my office chair. You could tokenize this microphone I'm talking to you on, right? Like you can tokenize anything. It's just a, a token, literally, that stands in for something else, right? But um, what, what we're seeing is that it is really, and this is something I brought up in my art form article and I took a lot of heat for, and I tried to be really careful with how I phrased it to basically say, like on a technical level, does it encourage digital artists to make only static discrete objects in the sense of like a JPEG file, as opposed to interactive, fluid experiences um, that, you know, are like real time, open to their environment that pull new information, um, like, you know, software and internet based projects. Um, does it technically constrain them? Not necessarily. But it also does, you know, like it also clearly privileges just because in a philosophical way, right, it's suggesting that what you're buying is this kind of like discrete asset that's like registered forever on the blockchain, even though the work is not itself on chain, um, that it's a discrete asset that's not going to change. You know, like one of the big things about digital art is that it's iterative. Like one of the advantages of working with digital tools is that you can keep iterating a project over and over. You can just like slightly change the parameters or you can do this or that. And 
um, you can introduce new variables and and you can have people participate. And so, um, you you know, the digital artwork becomes this kind of umbrella project that contains lots of different instances and iterations. And that's very different philosophically from, um, you know, having this like one fixed JPEG file, right? Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that like what digital art looked like before, not that people aren't, you know, weren't making JPEGs and GIFs and stuff back then, but it also included these other things that like you couldn't really even like copy in that sense because it was like fluid and dynamic and iterative. And so. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, well, we have reached about the hour. So um Thank you so much for taking the time to educating me about the art world and us about the art world and especially digital art. Maybe just the last thing is uh, where can people keep up with you and your work? Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I feel like that was a weird note to end on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like me ranting about like iteration. But anyway, um, so uh, I have a website, which is just my full name, tinariversryan.com. And um, I tried to post PDFs of all of my published work there. Um, all of the reviews that I've written for Artforum over the years are just hyperlinked to, but Artforum, I think for its old stuff, like you can create a free account and access a lot of that. And you certainly are allowed like a certain number of free articles per month. So if anyone wants to read my old reviews, I've been reviewing shows of digital artists, um, you know, for a decade now. So yeah, so I try to put new work up there. And then uh, my exhibition. So one of my exhibitions, I mentioned Difference Machines, it just closed in January last month. Um, I have new projects um, that are, you know, being developed for 2024 and beyond. So you'll just have to follow me. You can um, sign up for my a newsletter on my website, which I like email maybe once a year. Um, but mostly I'm on, I'm on social, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, mostly on Twitter now. Um, and my handle on both is at Tina Rivers Ryan. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. It's nice to talk to somebody who um, wants to have the conversation and doesn't just want to completely shut it down from either side, frankly. Uh, and uh, who also, you know, likes to think about things like privilege and, and power and equity and justice. What a concept. 